that you not try to go and see him where he is or try to find out where he is. I've spoken to the doctors several times, and this time there's no way back for Bobby. So all we can do is pray him on. Um, with that, at least everybody's on the same page. Everybody I've talked to since I've come back here has had a different version of what's going on, and rather than repeat the same story and have Quana repeat the same story over and over again, they've asked me if I would just let you all know that that's what's going on. Bobby's gone, but the best of him remains, and that's what I want to show you tonight. Most of these paintings are in private collections, and most of you will never see them unless you are lucky enough to be invited to their homes. I've put them in no particular order. Instead, I, could we dim the lights, Dr. <coughs> Newhouse? I've got a shadow on there and I can't see. I put them in an order that I felt exemplified the different kinds of work he was capable of doing, which any of you who knew him well know is boundless. He had a very hard upbringing, and by the time this picture was taken, he had been taken from his parents when he was eight and made a ward of the Catholic Church. So, except for his brother Dana, who remained with him, his entire family was shattered. He went to grammar school on the Winnebago Reservation at St. Augustine's and then chose to go to St. Francis on the Rosebud for one thing because his mother was from that tribe and also because he'd heard they had a good football team. <laughs> um, it was there that he heard of the Oscar Howe Summer Art Institute as it existed at that time and and he drew some some pieces to turn in to see if he qualified. And since there were no art classes, his teachers were accusing him of having copied them. One of the things I've tried to do with this lecture is put in some of his early work because what he brought to the Institute and what he brought to USD was an innate, incredible talent that Dr. Howe and everyone else who mentored him nurtured, but the talent was always there. Many times he would tell me how uncomfortable he felt in the early days being one of the only Native Americans here. There wasn't a, an Indian center and there weren't a lot of mentors. If it hadn't been for Dr. Howe and his influence, everything might have been completely different. At one point, he was even thinking of going into professional boxing, following his father. And um, thank God for the rest of us, he chose to go into painting instead. He was a traditional dancer. And when he was young, when this picture was taken, some of the elders out on the rosebud would tease him about <coughs> being too young, and, and he would get extremely upset at, at that and said, I want to learn the traditional ways. I want to do everything correctly the way it's been passed down for generations. And he did that both in his dancing and in his life and in his work. He wouldn't paint anything unless he knew for certain that it was correct, if he was portraying native things. And he spent a long time doing research on that and he got very upset with anyone who took liberties with that. I put this piece in next because Bobby used his own image in his work all through his life. And so he painted this from that photograph that you just saw. The red tail hawk was very important to him as a symbol of protection. And 
you will see it over and over and over in his paintings. It, he felt that the red tail personally protected him. And when we moved in 1988 to the farm that we lived on for the past 10 years, there were a pair of red tail hawks that lived just over the bluff down to the Vermilion River below us. And they would come up and they would just fly over the farm and he was always extremely happy to see them return in the spring. And he always called it Red Hawk Farm. The other symbol in this that you'll see appear over and over in his work is the lightning. For him, Wakyangi was a bringer of prosperity and a bringer of new life and a bringer of growth. And so when he would hear the first thunder and the first lightning in the spring, he would be so happy. He would say, ah, oh, Wakiangi is making the frogs wake up. He's, he's making the grass wake up. He's making the birds wake up. So over the years, I learned to be far less afraid of thunder and lightning than I was when I first moved to South Dakota because I realized the power and the force behind it were uh, in the end, a very nurturing force, and it's something that kept him going for years. <coughs> I put in a series of his pen and ink drawings, most of which a lot of people haven't seen. This is what he would do almost every morning. He would get up, and he would go out on the hill in front of the farm, and he would pray mostly just grateful for being alive another day. And then he'd come back into the studio and he would warm up. And these, he would, he would just draw whatever was around him. And these are a few of those. In fact, I fished them out of the trash. You know, he, did, he just said, oh, those are just warm ups. They don't, anybody could do that. <coughs> I beg to differ. This was his studio, I believe, in, in Bismarck. This was another one that I rescued. And one of the things that I've always believed about Bobby is that the thing that made him a great artist was that he knew when to stop. Other people have differed with him over that issue over the years because they would find God help them, pencil marks in their oil paintings or blank areas in their watercolors. But he had, and, and, and Dr. Howe has said this, he had an innate sense of balance. So he always knew exactly where to place everything and when to stop. Most artists tend to go on and on until they've ruined the piece. But this is one that exemplifies that. And that's one reason I really love it. This is another view of a studio that he had in Vermilion that he shared with Peter Vogley. He was a drummer for years in several different rock and roll bands. And so his drum stool did double duty as a painting stool for many years. And this is, um, this is an early morning view of that studio. Most of these are early morning. He, re he liked the early morning light for drawing. And that's just the living room. He, um, like I said, he just used these to warm up so that once he would get back into the studio and actually start his painting, he would already have that creative flow going on. This is a piece that the university owns. It's very small. It's about five by seven inches, perhaps. And over the course of his career, he would honor Dr. Howe by doing pieces in what he called the Oscar House style. And this is one of them. He told me that Dr. Howe had said, please don't, 
continue my work. I've already done my work. Please find your own way. He, he knew how much talent Bobby had and how multifaceted it was. And he said, don't recreate the past, create the future. And Bobby did that. But occasionally to honor Dr. Howe, because he was n not only teacher but mentor, he would go back and do a piece like this. Many years after he did this piece, he told me that he had done it the night we met. I didn't know that for years. You know, he just sort of, oh, by the way, I did this for you. Hmm. Thank you. It's called Love Song. This is another piece that he did in the Oscar House style. This one is out at the Octa Lakota Museum on the grounds of St. Joseph's Indian School in Chamberlain. He had a very close <coughs> relationship with uh, Father Tom, who ran that institute for a long time. And, and consequently, they have an excellent collection of some of his more commercial pieces. This is done in scratchboard. It's about 10 by 10 inches. And if you don't know what scratch board is, it's a, it's a flat board coated with black into which you scratch with a pin to reveal the white. So it's exactly the opposite of making a drawing. You're, you're removing what you don't want. He was very good at that. The moons behind him you will see over and over and over in Bobby's work. And what he told me about them was that, especially when he was portraying a male figure, he would put the moons in to symbolize the female half, the subconscious, the nurturing, without which the warrior has no foundation. So that's what they meant to him. Other people have their own ideas, and that was always just fine with him. This is another small scratch board piece that's out in Chamberlain. It's about 8 by 10 inches, and you'll see this face appear over and over in his work in watercolor, in oil, in chalk, in pen and ink. And I asked him once who that was, and he said, that's the grandfather. I met Bobby 10 years ago in Arizona. I was working in a gallery, and he was having an art show at a rival gallery, and so my boss sent me over there to check out the competition. And Bobby was sitting with all of his pieces around him. <coughs> and the painting of the sisters was behind him. So that was my first impression of Bob Penn, and it was quite overwhelming. I married him two weeks later, and somehow we were on our way to South Dakota. <laughs> I was very surprised when that happened, but I've never regretted it, despite the snow. When, when we moved here, <clears throat> I had a small etching press, and I was going back and forth between printmaking and oil painting, and had been for probably 15 years. But I soon had an epiphany that two oil painters in one family were one too many oil painters, especially if one of them is Bobby Penn. So I gave up oil painting for this past 10 years and stuck to printmaking, which is something that I felt I knew more about than he did. <laughs> so <coughs> I would prepare the plates and bring them home, and then he would scratch the image into the zinc. And then, because by that time, his lungs were so bad, and uh, he was having such a hard time with, with toxicity, I would just take the image and I would go and put it in the nitric acid and I would print for him.